Worship of Grace starts now. Hey everyone, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. My name is Tim Wright. I am the pastor here at Community of Grace Lutheran Church, coming to you from our campus in Peoria, Arizona, and so glad to be joining you as we worship together. Wherever you are, whenever you're watching this, Jesus is there with you, and whatever it is uh, that's on your heart today, Jesus is going to speak to you. So I'm excited that you're joining with us today, and we're able to join with you. Uh, we're in a series right now called Losing My Religion. And we're talking about some of those faith topics, some of those faith stories that tend to trip us up, much like these uh, parking lot stubs do. Sometimes we trip over them, and we trip over these questions about faith. And today we've got one of those really big stories, the story of Noah and the ark, and the story of mass destruction. And so we're going to look at what that story has to say today about the character of God. And, and this is always a good time to remind ourselves of an important ingredient when it comes to looking at Bible stories. And that's to always remember that these stories were not written to us, they were written for us. Uh, what we're going to see in a little bit is this is a story that was written to people who lived six, 7,000 years ago. And their mindset's very different than ours. And so the story was written to them in their language through their worldview, and then our task is to understand how they took the story, how they understood it, and then ask the question, what is God saying for us today through this story? So we're going to look at this great story. Glad you're joining with us, and we worship together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Hey everybody, it's your good friend Captain America with a brand new episode of Superhero Animal Theater. Today's story is about a man by the name of Noah. Where's Noah? But you have to watch out because it might be a panda hiding in this video. It's a panda hiding in this video. Okay, so we've got a panda bear hiding. We've got to see if we can find the panda bear while we're each doing the story. Each a story. All right. Each, All right. Okay. So, tell there's Noah. Noah. And it's very sunny. We see the boat is on the grass. But then what happens, Matilda? Rainstorm. A rainstorm. Oh, no. Let's see. Oh, look at those clouds. Can you lift that up a little bit? We got rain in the bottom. It's going to rain. And so Noah says he needs to get all the animals into his boat so that they don't get wet. Can you put the animals in the boat? But maybe something bad will happen to the hippo. Oh, we'll see. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're putting all the animals in. There's the hippo. Come here. Come in. Please help me get that oh, in. Yep, I get that in. Mm -hmm. The lion will come up here. All right. He's the king of the savannah. He's the king of the savannah. Mm -hmm. All right. And he, he Noah's going to bring his car. He oh. saw his car and he drove into the boat. Okay, so he drove, okay. All right, drove okay. into the boat. And he got on it. Stayed in his car. And he stayed on the shade. All right. Okay. My people's car. And then it started to rain. And the and the wind. It was for the food animals. Food. It was food for the animals. And you know what they sang while it was raining? What? Rain drops keep falling on my head. That doesn't mean my eyes will see. Uh oh. Matilda, what happened to the hippo? He fell down. Oh no, into he, the water? He is now. You have to watch part two to see what happens to the hippo. All right, stay tuned for part two next week. The story of Noah. Did you find the panda bear? We'll be back next week. Same Noah time. Same Noah station. Well, for those of you who are all stressed out, thinking to yourselves, you've got to wait another week to see the exciting conclusion to that story, I have good news for you. It's coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, before we look at the second part of that great story, I want to give you an opportunity to connect with us. If you are watching us for the first time or you've been checking in for a few weeks, uh, we'd like to send you a gift card to Starbucks. All you need to do is text you the word NEW to 623-295-2484, 623-295-2484. Text that word NEW, and we're going to send you that card to Starbucks. If you've got a prayer request, we would love the opportunity to pray for you this week, and we will do that. We have a number of people who will pray for you this week. And if you simply like to know more about what's coming up here at Community of Grace, either in-house or online, text the word EVENTS. We are close now to reopening uh, for the fall. We're, we're in-house, but we're going to be launching some of our new programs now in-house in the fall. If you'd like to know more about that, again, just text the word EVENTS to 623-295-2484. So we're in a season right now, we're going to be talking about this a lot these next several weeks and months, where we're inviting us as a congregation to go bold and live grace. And what that means is we're rolling up our sleeves and we're going to follow Jesus into this world that has been so broken by so many things and bring grace to the world. And part of the way we do that is through our giving, going bold in our giving. And I've been inviting you these last few weeks and will continue to do so to simply pray to do something bold and ask God what God would have you give to support your church, Community of Grace, in the mission that we do together. And it's through your giving that we're able to come to you online. We're able to do in-house worship and other programming. We're able to get out into the community and out into the world with God's grace. And so I encourage you to go bold, live grace, and pray about what God would have you give. And then you can support the church in this way. You can text in your gift 
to 623-295-2484, 623-295-2484. And just type in how much you'd like to give and hit send. You can hold the camera up on your phone and get that QR code. That will give you some prompts to follow, and you can give that way. Or you can go to boldrecklessgrace.org forward slash giving, boldrecklessgrace.org forward slash giving giving, and that will give you different opportunities for supporting your church. And so this is our opportunity in light of God's bold grace to go bold and live grace through our giving. Letting go of every single dream, I'll lay each one down at your feet. Every moment of my wandering Never changes what you see I try to win this war, I confess My hands are weary, I need your rest Mighty warrior, king of the fire Everybody, it is your old pal Captain America back for part two of our superhero animal theater. Last week, as you remember, we heard a story about how it was going to rain and storm, and all the rain and the water was going to come. And our good friend Noah wanted to save all of his friends, but then something happened while they were on the boat. What happened, Matilda? The hippo? Fall off. Oh, the hippo fell off into the water. And now we need to find out where the hippo landed. So the hippo floated on the water. And the hippo floated on the water. And where did the hippo land up, Matilda? On 
on the desert island. On a desert island. He fell off the waterfall and onto the desert island. And, oh, I wonder if people can see the panda somewhere. Can anybody find the panda, the secret panda? No, you don't see it. So then the hippo was out there and Noah and the ark, they were over here in the water. And Noah said to the flamingo, go and see if there's any land. And so the flamingo went flying, chirp, 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 and found the hippo on the island. And the hippo climbed onto his back and they flew back to the ark, chirp, 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 chirp. And the hippo was safe and the flamingo was safe and the water started to go down and Noah saved all the animals. Secret panda. And there's the secret panda. Secret panda. Secret panda. The end. The story of Noah and the ark is one of the more complicated stories in the Bible, and there are a lot of complicated stories in the Bible, but this one is particularly complicated. On the one hand, as we just saw from that video, uh, we tend to see the story of Noah and the ark as this wonderful children's story. Uh, we buy little arks for our kids and they fill them up with all these fun animals or maybe we put an ark up on the wall in our children's nursery room and uh, we see this as this wonder-filled story of this old man named Noah saving all of these animals on his boat. On the other hand, when we read the story, we find out that this seems to be the story of mass destruction at the hand of God. And so it's a complicated story. And it's a story that constantly trips us up because we often misunderstand the story. Now, it is true that at the heart of this story is the character of God. And depending on how we read the story, it can raise a lot of questions about God. And that leads to the question we have for today. How can you believe in a God who destroys the world in a flood? Or how can you believe in a genocidal, maniacal God? But for us to get at the heart of the story, for us to get at the heart of who God is, it's important for us to do a little bit of work, and I hope you'll allow me some time to do that today. We have to understand the context of this story so that we can get the story right. You see, if we get the starting point wrong, then we're going to keep tripping over this story, and we're going to constantly ask the question, how can you believe in that kind of God? But if we get the starting point right, then we'll see God differently, and we'll see the story differently, and we'll see a word of grace and hope for those of us living in the 21st century. So we're going to do a little bit of context here before we look at the story. And the first thing that's important for us to remember, and I mentioned this earlier at the beginning of the service, is that this is a story that was written some five, 6,000 years ago. It's an ancient story. And it's an ancient story written to an ancient group of people. And so these people had a very different mindset than we have today, a very different worldview. They saw life very differently. So, for example, they didn't have the science and the technology that we have available to us today. So when it came to weather, for instance, they didn't understand the science of weather. They didn't understand weather patterns. Everything seemed to happen without rhyme or reason. One day it would rain, the next day it wouldn't. For some months there were drought, and then other months maybe so much rain that it flooded the land, and it made no sense to them. They didn't have the science to understand what was going on. And so many of the cultures at that time looked to the heavens. They looked to the gods, and they assumed that the gods were the ones responsible for weather. And so they had to figure out a way to manipulate the gods or to appease the gods or to somehow bribe the gods to make the weather do what the human beings needed it to do, to make it rain when they needed it to rain, to make the rain stop when they needed the rain to stop. And so at that time, 6,000 years ago, they believed that weather happened at the hands of God. And so it would make sense then that if you're telling a story about a flood 6,000 years ago, that you would automatically say that the flood happened at the hand of God. They're using... The language, they're using the insight, they're using the stories, the metaphors, the science, so to speak, that they had available to them at that time to explain life as they were experiencing it. But now in the 21st century, we know differently. 
We have science. We have technology. We understand weather patterns. We know that uh, sometimes there's a, a disturbance in the weather patterns, and it can cause floods. And yet, even though we have the science to understand weather, we still sometimes say that a flood or an earthquake or a hurricane is an act of God, even though we know it's a, a weather pattern that happens and we can explain it scientifically. So when we read this story, we need to remember, first of all, that this is an ancient story written to ancient people who had a very limited world view, a very limited view of how the world worked, and they used the language available to them at the time. They also had a very small world. Their world was their neighborhood or the region where they lived, and they believed that if it happened in their neighborhood, it was happening in the whole world because their whole world was their neighborhood. And so if their village was flooded, they assumed that the whole world had been flooded. Now again, we know differently. We know that if it's raining here in Phoenix, that doesn't necessarily mean it's raining across the world in Rwanda. But at the same time, we can understand a bit of their perspective. Those of us who live here in Phoenix, we have been through a monsoon season. And it can be a very strange experience. You can have rain just uh, falling by the buckets full in your backyard for an hour. And you'll assume because it's raining that hard in your backyard that it must be raining like that throughout all of Phoenix. But then you call your friends who are five minutes away. They didn't get a drop of water. You've assumed they did because you got rain, but the weather pattern hadn't hit where they're living. And that's what's happening in this story. There is no archaeological evidence, there's no geological evidence that there was a worldwide flood, but that doesn't change the impact of this story. For those who wrote the story, those who were reading the story for the first time, this flood, even though it was localized, happened in the entire world, and it was devastating. Now, the most important thing we need to keep in mind, and then we'll get to the story, is this, that the story that we have recorded for us, written some 6,000 years ago, is an ancient tool for telling stories. And what writers would do is they would take an event, like a flood, and they would reposition it as a theological story about God or about the gods. They used a real event to try to say something about the character of God. And for the people of Israel, they wanted to use a story like this to say that their God is radically different than all the other gods. And so when we read this story, we need to keep in mind that the flood is a metaphor to help us understand the character of God. And so with that, let's take just a couple moments to look at the story in some real broad strokes. The story of Noah and the ark really begins in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. The Bible says that God's spirit was hovering over the chaos. God's spirit was hovering over the void, over the darkness. And God begins to speak to that chaos to bring order out of chaos, to create. And the metaphorical way to understand God bringing order out of chaos is that God created boundaries day by day. God created a boundary between night and day. God created a boundary between the waters below and the waters above. God created a boundary between the waters and the land. And once order was established, once all these boundaries were created, then God filled those boundaries with life. And when God was done after six days of bringing life where there was darkness, bringing order where there was chaos, God stepped back and God saw that it was really good. But two chapters later, the story takes a turn. Adam and Eve, living in this good world that God has created, decide that they want to live by human wisdom rather than God's wisdom. And that unleashes not only death, it unleashes chaos. It unleashes violence. It unleashes murder. Their firstborn son, Cain, kills Abel, his brother. And then chapter after chapter, the violence and the murder escalates until we get to chapter 6, just five chapters later, after the creation of the world, chapter 6, where now the world is flooded with chaos and anarchy and violence and murder. And so chapter 6 says this, The Lord God saw the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. In chapter 1, what God saw was good. By the time we get to chapter 6, what God sees is evil. And it breaks God's heart. God grieves because the work of his hands, the people that God has created, the people that God loves, are bringing great pain onto themselves, and that grieves the heart of God. So what we need to keep in mind now is that this is a theological story about the character of God. And what's important here is how God responds to that grieved heart. And what we see in this story is that God's response to the chaos that human beings has unleashed is to intervene and to intervene with grace. And the intervention that takes place in this flood story is the intervention that will be the through line for the rest of the Old Testament into the New Testament and then on into the 21st century. Because God chooses to intervene in that moment to begin the process of bringing order back to the chaos, of putting to rights what we've put to wrong. And God chooses to do that through a family. God, by grace, chooses Noah. Noah becomes the ancestor of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. And it is the, father, or it is the Jewish people that God has chosen to bless the world through. And God will bless the entire world. God will put to rights all the brokenness in the world through the Jewish people and specifically through a Messiah. And that Messiah, Jesus, the ancestor of Noah, the ancestor of Abraham, goes to the cross for you and for me, for the world, so that, so that through his death and his resurrection, Jesus can reconcile the word, world to God and Jesus can begin to put to rights what we've put to wrong. The story of the flood is not about a God who out of anger destroys the world. The story of the flood is not the story of a genocidal, maniacal God. The story of the flood is the story of God entering into the flood of chaos we unleashed and intervenes through starting a family through whom the world will be saved. And that ultimate person in that family is Jesus, who through his death and resurrection begins to put to right what's wrong. Now here we are, we're in the 21st century, and we still live in a world flooded with chaos and murder and violence and brokenness and despair. COVID, the fall of Afghanistan, an earthquake in Haiti, a report last week about the dramatic changes taking place in our climate, the dangerous changes taking place, an insurrection on the capital of the United States of America, suffering, poverty, disease, famine, war, this flood of chaos, and we live in the midst of it. And what the flood story tells us is that when life seems out of control, God is busy intervening with grace. And he does that through Jesus, who comes to us to begin to put the broken pieces back together. Philip Yancey, in his wonderful book, What's So Amazing About Grace, tells the story of a friend of his, a pastor friend of his, and uh, this pastor and his wife were having difficult problems with their daughter, 15-year-old daughter. She would lie to them all the time. She would stay out all night long and not check in. And then she would turn around and blame them saying it was their fault because they were such strict parents. And as the father is pouring out his heart to Philip Yancey about his daughter, he says this. He says, I remember standing before the plate glass window in my living room, staring out into the darkness, waiting for her to come home. I felt such rage. I wanted to be like the father of the prodigal son, yet I was furious with my daughter for the way she would manipulate us and twist the knife to hurt us. And of course, she was hurting herself more than anyone else. I understood then the passages in the prophets expressing God's anger. The people knew how to wound him, and God cried out in pain. 
And yet, I must tell you, when my daughter came home that night, or rather the next morning, I wanted nothing in the world so much as to take her in my arms, to love her, to tell her I wanted the best for her. I was a helpless, love-sick father. And that's the story of the flood. It's not the story of a God who just destroys all humankind. It is not the story of a genocidal maniac. It is the story of a wounded father, a lovesick father, who sees the flood of chaos that we've unleashed and intervenes by entering into our world in the person of Jesus to experience all of that chaos personally, to die on a cross and rise again to absorb that pain, that chaos, so that through the resurrected Jesus, God can come to us in this moment right now and begin to put to rights what's wrong in our lives so that we can go back out into our world and bring that grace that brings reconciliation. So in this moment, that God, the God of the cross, comes to you with grace in order to bring to you healing and wholeness. And so on the night which he's betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you, eat this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink and said, this is my blood, it's been poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins, drink this for the remembrance of me. Let's pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you eat the cracker, as you eat that little piece of bread, this is the body of Christ given for you. And as you drink the grape juice, as you drink the wine, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you unto everlasting life. Peace be with you. Amen. Again, it's been, it's been good to be with you as we worship God together, as we hear good news from God. And if you found this service helpful, if you've got some friends maybe who wrestle with stories like the story of Noah and the ark, I encourage you to share this on your Facebook page. And that gives uh, us an opportunity to share this message of grace with your friends. I encourage you to do that. Next weekend, we're going to continue the series, and we're going to ask one of those big questions again. How can you believe in a God who murders his own son? What's that all about? And why would God do that? So we're going to look at the story of Jesus and what is the cross really all about? What does the cross say about who God is? Uh, we come to you every Saturday at 5 o'clock here at Phoenix time on Facebook and YouTube. And if you can't join us at 5 o'clock, those services are available for you on demand after that. And then we are also meeting in-house, 9 o'clock and 1030 every weekend. And we'd love to have you join us in-house if you'd like to come. We're keeping it safe. And you can bring some friends along as well if you've got friends who are wrestling with issues of faith. And I promise you, whether they watch it online or they're in-house with us, it's going to be a service that they're going to enjoy and they're going to hear about God's grace. So I encourage you to share with them. And now as you go, may our loving Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face smile upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord always turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week.